Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for our webinar today on universal design, ensuring equitable access to education in the transition to online teaching and learning for students with disabilities and vulnerable students. Um, this webinar is a continuation of our series of webinars about copyright, fair use, and open educational resources, and thinking through the process of this emergency transition to online teaching and learning. And while we discussed questions around accessibility and formats and universal design in earlier webinars, we felt like it was important to take a time here and do a deep dive to think through why it's both very important to keep accessibility in mind when you're transitioning to online teaching or finding or creating OER, but also why there are established tools to evaluate teaching resources and to guide your creation projects so that you don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel in these efforts. Um, my name is Meredith Jacob. I'm the project director for the Creative Commons US project at the Program for Information Justice and Intellectual Property. And I'll be sort of moderating our talk through the presenters today. Um, our first presenter we have is Prue Adler, who is one of our partners at American University and is going to sort of introduce the basic sort of framework for thinking about accessibility and universal design. Prue, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Meredith. Um, and good, good afternoon and um, thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I will set the table very briefly regarding universal design and the important role it plays in creating an inclusive environment for everyone, not just those with disabilities. Schools and institutions of higher education have a legal and ethical obligation to make their services and resources universally accessible to their communities. This reflects educational values and is also necessary in order to comply with longstanding legal requirements. Universal design recognizes that designing the classroom, both in person and online, for maximum inclusion of diverse learning styles and abilities will bring unintended benefits to the entire population that is served. Instead of a, a one size fits all approach, if you will, it can be customized to meet the individual learner where she is and provides all students with equal access and opportunities to learn. Um, you're gonna be hearing this throughout the, the webinar today, but we can't emphasize it enough. Universal design works for all learners. It should not be seen as a solution for those with disabilities. It, it is, um, think of it this way, think about curb cuts and how helpful curb cuts are for those who are toting luggage. Uh, it also works for captioning. We found, um, for example, that many students have a higher learning capacity when working with captioning regardless of their ability. There has been a constant drumbeat of national and international accessibility laws and treaties in support of those with disabilities. It has been a long slog, but the U.S. has led these efforts for many decades. These range from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to the more recent Marrakesh Treaty for the Visually Impaired, which the US was instrumental in its development and its uh, ratification. You will hear more from Dan on US law and policy. And these range from the Americans with Disabilities Act to update the copyright law with regard to those with disabilities to recent court cases such as access to the Hathi Trust database of over 17 million million digitized text, to the settlement at Harvard regarding deaf individuals, and finally, to numerous settlements with higher education and libraries over inaccessible materials. All of these laws and policies have led to the development and increasing adoption of universal design principles. There remains much to be done, but you will hear from Jonathan that there is a very solid foundation as well as the tools needed to build upon and to ensure open, accessible resources for all learners. With that, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Lazar. I'm a professor in the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. And I'm also associate director of the TRACE Center, which is the nation's oldest research center on disability and technology. 
So I wanted to start by talking about what is universal design? And I want to follow up on Prue's comment. You know, often people think, oh, universal design. Well, that's something for just students with disabilities. Universal design actually helps everyone. Because universal design in a nutshell is just flexibility, right? You are designing educational resources so that they're flexible depending on how people need input, how people need to approach the information. So for instance, for a lot of students with disabilities, they may use an alternate input or output device, right? So you hear about you know, students who are deaf who may uh, need captioning, right? Students with learning disabilities who may use captioning, students um, who are blind who may need screen readers, people who may not be able to use pointing devices. Whatever tool someone has, that's their tool. But realize that if you don't design your educational resources to be flexible, right? Students cannot access those educational resources. So it's not enough. Often you hear that, well, you know, the, the students just need, the blind students just needs to get whatever tool they need, right? And then they're good. Well, no, you have to design your material, your content, your resources to be flexible. And that's the key thing. Universal design means flexibility. And universal design helps students with disabilities, but it's much broader than students with disabilities. Next slide, please. Now, many people out there have iPhones. Some have Android phones. Imagine that we said, I'm sorry, our educational resources are only usable if you're accessing them from an iPad, or they're only usable if you're using an Android device. Or if you're using Google Chrome as a browser, I'm sorry, you can't access them. Realize that everyone benefits from universal design. Why? You're making your resources available to a broad range of individuals, right? People who are using different devices, people who are using um, tablet computers and phones and uh, laptops and desktops, different size screens. Also, one of the interesting things going on right now is we're discovering how many people in the US have low bandwidth. And so when you're in a location where maybe you don't have a uh, very high bandwidth access to the internet, right? You may not be able to do streaming video. You may need it in a different format, right? Um, this is true in both developing areas within the US and in developing countries as well. You know, we often tend to think that the user of our content is sitting there, right? in a city with a high bandwidth connection, right? All with plenty of electricity. In many cases right now, people don't. And it may also be that they need to do caregiving for someone. And so whatever this educational uh, information is, they're accessing it on their phone because they need to balance it in one hand as they have a baby in the other hand. So you need to think about the flexibility. Situations also where users must temporarily switch modalities. You know, if you were in some place where you can't have audio on, or if you're driving and you want to be able to listen to the resource, the reality is universal design helps everyone. People think of accessibility features as being for, you know, the one in five Americans who have a disability. Microsoft actually estimated that over 57% of users benefit from access features. So it's not just people with disabilities. It's everyone that benefits from universal design. Now, one of the most important things is to think about accessibility from the beginning. Right now, as people are starting to plan how to do their online courses in the fall, right now as you're starting to think what educational resources you want to put up online, this is the time to think about accessibility, not at the end. Because at the beginning, accessibility is easy to do. It's easy to integrate accessibility. You know, you sometimes hear people saying, well, I, I can't do accessibility. It's expensive. There's a cost. The cost is only really because you're doing it at the end. You're doing it the wrong way. You know, Dan Goldstein often talks about, well, of course, accessibility is expensive because you didn't do it when you built the building. If you build a building inaccessibly and want to go back and retrofit, yeah, that's going to be expensive. But accessibility is not inherently expensive. It's only expensive when you leave it until the end of development. So we want everyone to start thinking about inserting accessibility right now at the beginning, as you're developing tools and technologies and content. Start thinking about accessibility now. There are many tools to make accessibility easy. 
Now, for most of you who are developing educational resources, you're using a tool. You're using a web development tool or a content management system, or you're using a learning management system, or you're using an office automation uh, software application. All of these tools have accessibility features. So if I can leave you with one thought, I wanna leave you with that thought that if you say accessibility is expensive, that's because you're doing it wrong. It's not expensive, it's easy. You should use existing tools. You should insert it early on into your process. Next slide, please. So this is what I was starting to say. Insert it into your workflows as early as possible. Now, if you're unsure about what accessibility means, if you're unsure about what the standards would be, I would encourage you to do a few things. First of all, consult with disability consumer organizations, groups like National Association of the Deaf, National Federation of the Blind. They want to work with you. They want to give you feedback. Don't just put the demands on you have this one student who's blind on campus and you're gonna ask that blind student everything. A, they're busy being a student. B, right, they may not know about the needs of people with other disabilities. So talk with disability consumer organizations. Ask them questions. They wanna work with you. Use the existing features of your content development tools, right? People often think, well, I don't have the time to learn about how to code accessibility. No one's asking you to learn how to code accessibility. We're saying use the features that exist and use existing technical standards, right? There are a series of technical standards that are used around the world. So for instance, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is the most well-documented set of accessibility guidelines anywhere. There are examples, right? There are explanations. There are how-to videos, WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That's if you're doing web content. What about if you're creating eBooks? Well, then you wanna use the EPUB 3 standard. You can make an eBook fully accessible using EPUB 3 and very usable for everyone. Now, generally, WCAG and EPUB 3 are preferable to a PDF file. Because let's face it, a lot of people don't like PDF files. They're very inflexible. They're hard to use. But if you need to present your content in a PDF file, there are also accessibility standards for PDF known as uh, Universal Accessibility or PDF UA. So there are existing technical standards. There are tools available for you to help. You don't have to create any new solutions. All we're asking is that you apply existing solutions. Next slide, please. Ah, there we go. So here are just two examples of the access tools available to you already. On the right, it's a screenshot of accessibility tools within Microsoft PowerPoint, if you're gonna put up PowerPoints up there, right? So you can run an accessibility checker. There are similar accessibility checkers in everything, in um, everything from Google Docs to, um, Oh my gosh, any of the core learning management system tools, right? On the left is an example when you're adding content to one of the learning management systems, it stops you and asks you for alt text. So you have a description of a graphic. Now keep in mind, not every tool is gonna stop you and ask, but every tool has that functionality. So you need to think about, okay, let me find out what are the accessibility tools in PowerPoint? What are the accessibility tools in Adobe Acrobat? The tools already exist out there. They can help you make your content, your educational resources, fully usable for a large swath of users. This is really important because it makes all of your content be used by more people, right? I remember early on in one of the legal cases related to accessibility, one of the people at a company who was fighting against accessibility said, well, I didn't realize these people could be customers realize that if you want your educational resources to be used by the largest number of people possible, what you need to do is make them universally usable. You need to use universal design techniques so more people can access the content that you're creating, the resources, the tools, the applications, right? What you're talking about is how do I make my educational resources reach a much larger audience? That's the goal of universal design. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, and so to talk specifically about um, thinking through how to um, 
go through the process of looking for uh, features that allow access and looking for features that are aligned with universal design. Um, on the next slide, I want to introduce Cynthia Curry, who joins us from CAST and who's going to talk specifically about accessibility in the context of open educational resources. Cynthia, thanks so much for joining us. Will you tell us a little bit about who you are and your work and how that relates to OER? Sure. Thank you so much for the for the invitation, and thank you, Jonathan. Uh, your what, why, and how is a perfect segue uh, into the next section. I I uh, work at Cast. Uh, Cast is is widely known for its work, uh, pioneering work and research around universal design for learning, which is a little bit different from universal design, um, but uh, it's based on the same principles and applies that to to learning, to pedagogy, goals, methods, assessment. Uh, and my work there is specifically around creating, uh, procuring, uh, selecting accessible educational materials and technologies. And we work across uh, the lifespan of education. So from, we call it twinkles to wrinkles. We are early childhood. We work with state ed and local education agencies, higher ed, workforce. And we also work uh, specifically with, with ed tech developers and publishers around both increasing the accessibility of the products that they put on the market, as well as bringing ed tech developers and publishers together with consumers uh, around shared, uh, you know, shared goals, as well as there are a lot of misconceptions that often happen between the developers, the publishers, and the consumers. So we try to be those conveners and, and that bridge. So um, I have a, a terrific job at CAST at the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials for Learning. And I'm just going to take a, a, a few minutes to go over some of the strategies that we promote uh, through our technical assistance. We're funded through the US Department of Education. Uh, so we are no cost of free technical assistance. And we have worked um, in the past uh, with OER um, in partnerships because the advantage of OER is if something isn't accessible, there are obviously ways because it's open um, under Creative Commons licenses where it can be retrofitted. And if you have the right tools, if you know how to look at these materials um, through a lens of accessibility, uh, there are some ways that you can do it uh, with some of the tools that are already available. Um, just makes it uh, much easier when things are open. Next slide, please. So evaluating for OER, the, the model that we recommend is POR. Uh, the POR model is, was developed from the, by the World Wide Web Consortium Web Accessibility Initiative that develops the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that Jonathan just referred to. And when it comes to accessibility, um, you know, you can also look through a lens of universal design. Um, the, the POR model is really helpful because it looks at, uh, helps guide you through an analysis of a resource through physical, sensory, and cognitive access. And through that route, you typically also uh, get to more usable content for everybody. So I'll show you some, um, some examples of that. POR stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Uh, when a resource is perceivable, you know, the question that you're asking there is, are there alternative means for accessing the visual and the audio content? So regardless of how the content is conveyed, are there, al al are there alternative means? So if something is developed, uh, it is, uh, includes an image, is there another way? So Jonathan mentioned alt text. Are there alt text or long descriptions attached to those images? If something's in audio, is there also that same content conveyed uh, in text through closed captions? Uh, are there audio descriptions for people who can't see the action happening on the screen? Operable, the question there is, is the content structured so that users of assistive technology can interact with it? Uh, realizing that not every user approaches content through a keyboard and a mouse or a trackpad. So if a screen reader user needs to access the content, if somebody with a physical disability uses a switch or somebody with a learning disability uses text-to-speech, uh, is it interoperable with speech recognition for people who may not communicate uh, verbally? And of course, these features are also supportive to those of us who prefer to listen to content. We are on a bus or if we are uh, traveling in a, a air, in a gym. So these um, same strategies around operable apply to other settings. Understandable, the question is, is the content presented in a clear and intuitive way? So plain language is an example of that. Is the content presented in a consistent format, making the information uh, predictable? And is it robust? Uh, and Jonathan uh, referred to this as well, around making sure that the content works across all types of devices and platforms, as well as interoperability with, uh, with individuals' assistive technology. 
Next slide. So here's a, a graphic uh, that we developed at the, at the National AIM Center. We have similar graphics for uh, operable, understandable, and robust, but I just wanted to show you an example uh, from that set that we have. This one is for perceivable, and it shows how content can be presented in other ways than just visual and audio, which are obviously uh, the most common ways that content is presented through open education resources. So on the far left is an image of somebody reading a Braille book. Uh, that's an e the easiest way to present content that may be av available in a tactile way. But if it's digital, it can be made uh, available through Braille, through refreshable electronic Braille. The next image has a tablet or a smartphone with uh, adjustable uh, contrast. Of course, high contrast would be, uh, would be something that would create more understandability with the content because high contrast is so important uh, in order to be able to um, understand the information. Uh, the next image shows closed captioning on a video. And then the final image shows of, of alt text for an image of water. So the output is an audio um, in alt text uh, that is simply water. Next slide. We have a com an upcoming uh, webinar on this topic of accessible uh, OER curation. It's Monday, June 8th. It's from 3 to 4 Eastern. Uh, we are co-presenting this with ISCMI, uh, the Institute of Knowledge Management um, in Education. And uh, it's free. It's open. Uh, it's for registration. And I dropped the link. I'll also put it in the chat at the end of my talk. Uh, but it's a bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash AIM OER, A-E-M OER, all in uh, uppercase. So during that webinar protocol for evaluating the accessibility of OER, as well as an associated checklist that we've developed will be, uh, will be introduced and released. Next slide. And then of course, when you are thinking about evaluating OER for accessibility, it's really much easier to do that if the resource was created uh, to be accessible. So creating accessible documents, as Jonathan said, it's, it's not high cost. The tools to develop something accessible, whether it's a document or a slide deck or video, uh, we're fortunate in the year 2020 to have these tools built into the applications. So it's a matter of learning what those are. Uh, creating accessible materials, um, particularly documents, I've been told is the gateway drug <laughs> to accessibility. Because once you start creating accessible content, you realize just how much more perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust your content is going to be for everybody. It makes content creation much more structured, much more efficient, uh, and the design is uh, so much better for, uh, for everybody. Your content becomes clear, uh, intuitive, uh, and predictable. So the key here is to remember that not everybody is going to access your materials and technologies with a keyboard and mouse. A lot of people are going to be using screen readers, they're going to be using their voices, they're going to rely on text-to-speech, um, they may be using switches because they have a physical disability. So at the same time, you're making your content more usable or accessible to them, it actually creates more structure for everybody. So we developed um, this acronym slide in order to uh, make this a mnemonic and easy to remember that when you're creating accessible content uh, to use styles which are built into every every editor every word processing editor so you use styles for structuring your content uh, through headings and making sure that you have consistent fonts and text sizes for uh, things like lists and the body of your text uh, that links are descriptive and meaningful so Never use click here um, as a description for a link because somebody who can't see the page and is using a screen reader, uh, they will hear that that link is titled click here and they won't know where that link is taking them. So rather than that, you might want to say, go to, uh, go to the AIM Center and the link would be aem.cast.org. Make sure that images have text descriptions, either alt text or long description. And there's an important distinction between those two. Uh, that the design is perceivable, so things like high contrast, making sure um, that the content is legible and there's a consistent font, 
and make sure that the evaluation is holistic and authentic. And Jonathan talked about uh, evaluation, checking for accessibility as well. And you need to remember that in order to do an authentic evaluation, you need to know a little bit about accessibility, uh, go into it using best practices, because if you don't know the best practices and then you do an accessibility check, you'll be given a lot of errors, but not necessarily know how to fix them. So going in with best intention and the best knowledge about accessibility means that you'll have more success on the evaluation end of the content creation. We have an archived webinar, recent one, it was from beginning of April, uh, on creating accessible documents and slide decks. And so I dropped uh, the link, it's another bit.ly, uh, and it's AIM Docs, A-E-M-D-O-C-S, all capitals. And I'll drop that link in the chat uh, at the end of my talk as well, which is just one more closing slide. And it's just to let you know um, that the AIM Center is, um, is as I mentioned, uh, next slide please, is funded through the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs. Uh, you may know OSEP as being under, under the umbrella of state education and local education agencies, but we work, as I said, across, um, across early childhood, K-12, higher ed, uh, workforce development. So we are here to support um, higher ed and what well, we are. Um, our website is aem.cast.org. You can contact us through aem at cast.org anytime. And you can also follow us, of course, um, on social media. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. So that was a quick overview. I was glad to be here. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and I think that's a very helpful perspective of how to think through, you know, understanding what you need to do and then also where places like CAST and others can provide the support so that you're not doing that on your own. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Christina Ishmael, who is a longtime partner in this project with us in explaining, uh, promoting, and supporting uh, the use of open educational resources. And Christina, I was hoping that you would talk to us a little bit about um, what a couple different sort of scenarios or points of practice are when teachers are faced right now with this emergency transition to online teaching, and either finding new resources or creating new resources, what some moments that they should be sort of aware of a decision point or a challenge and, you know, thinking through how you could then reach out to CAST or find teams in your community to evaluate and deal with that. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for uh, hosting this webinar. I know that this has come up in all of our previous um, sessions and I'm, I'm happy to know that folks are interested in this. Um, so as, as Meredith mentioned, my name is Christina Ishmael and I am a former classroom teacher and I think that's really important whenever um, I start to have conversations around this. I'm a former early childhood and elementary teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. And when I was in my teacher prep program, I took one class to focus on special education and that was part of my teacher prep program. And there are most often, whenever we have our, our folks that are in teacher prep programs, they are also required to take one class for our special education um, uh, kind of services, as well as for English learners now. And so uh, the, the thing that I did not learn in that class was actually around universal design and universal design for learning. So I think that it's really important to know that it's okay if you don't know this. Um, we don't know what we don't know, but we are certainly better off when we can learn these things. And so, um, like Jonathan had mentioned, we can't always um, request students with disabilities to be the folks that help us developing content. Um, we can't always request that our special education teachers be the folks that help us develop this content either. The onus falls on us as educators um, to also understand this and to learn more about this. So um, again, fortunate to be a part of this community and, and have learned a lot from Cynthia and the team at CAST um, and just through you know, a variety of things and, and resources that they have put out on, on their website. So I think the, the three things when it comes to K-12 teaching and learning are around materials, delivery, and then our class structures. Um, you have already heard things to consider around materials and even delivery uh, as far as digital and analog. It's even more important that we're looking at all of these considerations right now, given the fact that we are doing this emergency remote online learning. Um, 
moving forward and, and planning for summer school and for the potential scenarios that will happen in the fall and even beyond that, um, we the likelihood of us going back into traditional brick and mortar schools right now is pretty low um, because we know well, we don't know actually, but there is predictions of, of surges in the fall and in the winter. And so the likelihood of us going back at 100% um, participation is just really low. So how are we going to meet the needs of every student in that process? Um, when we are starting to design courses or thinking about content that we wanna put online through our learning management systems, hopefully fingers crossed um, that we have those because they have the accessibility features um, as part of those, then I think it would be really helpful for us to put that at the forefront, um, like Jonathan mentioned, when we start to create. The class structure is also really important. Um, typically in a, in a K-12 environment, um, and even in a pre-K, I should say, pre-K-12 environment, we either have uh, kind of two options, and that is the inclusion model um, or a pull-out model where our special ed teachers um, pull into smaller groups to help students with disabilities as far as reaching their IEP goals um, or their 504 plans. And so it's important for us to make sure that we are um, aware of what a student's plan may be and how they may need additional accommodations. And so that also impacts the class structure that we may currently have or will need to consider for um, the online learning environment. I think uh, one of the potential scenarios that we're hearing more and more is around bringing back early um, or young, our youngest learners. So a pre-K through third grade or a K through third grade coming back in because it's harder for them to access content online without direct guardian support or adult support. Um, so that is one thing um, to think about that we wouldn't necessarily have to develop uh, digital content for them, but there is always that case that if there is a surge in um, in cases that we would need to quickly go back to remote learning. And so what would that look like for our inclusion students that we have in the classroom and maybe we have paraprofessional support or special education support, um, or what would that look like if they are doing, um, they are getting pullout services. The uh, US Department of Education has issued some guidance on this, but we are really looking to the organizations that were already mentioned um, to help us. The National Center for um, Disabled Learners have, uh, have put out a lot of, I think, helpful guidance in even just em embracing the communication with parents and um, upping the communication with parents to make sure that parents know that they can advocate for certain things while we are online. And if that is our new kind of scenario that we have to really look at, then that is something that they can they need to continue to know that they can do and that they certainly should do to make sure that their uh, to make sure that their children are receiving their um, their fair and adequate educational access so i think the materials the delivery and the class structure are three kind of ways that we need to look at the accessibility um, when it comes to k-12 thanks christina and one thing mm -hmm. i think is really important in what you mentioned is particularly for our youngest students they are mostly going to be accessing teaching materials with the help of their parents and understanding them through the help of their parents. And I think one yeah. example of the importance of not just viewing this through a lens of have I provided an accessible version for students who have a diagnosed and recorded disability is that mm -hmm. you might have students who themselves don't need an accessible version, but that their parents and the people who are going, the guardians, the people who are gonna help them through those lessons might. And so I think it's yeah. another example of, if we start from a sort of universal design for learning framework and say, yeah. we don't know how everyone is going to need to access this, but we Correct. wanna go with the least restrictive, um, most sort of uh, enabling model, that yeah. in this online teaching and learning space, we have a whole lot of situations that we don't have significant experience with and that, you know, putting in the effort to think through issues of universal design will enable more people to make a really hard transition to this online teaching and learning. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, thank Christina you. will be around as well for the Q&A. And a reminder, there's a few raised hands we're not doing verbal questions. So if you have questions, they do need to go in the typed Q&A. Um, on our next slide, I wanted to introduce um, Mary Lee Vance and Rasan Ellison Johnson, who are joining us from uh, Cal State Sacramento, and who are gonna talk a little bit about um, 
a broad picture of uh, accessibility and universal design from an educational institutional perspective um, through sort of their experience at different institutions and then specifically in the transition to online teaching and learning at uh, Cal State Sacramento. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. And uh, I, unlike Jonathan, it's actually morning over here in California. So good morning to everybody good morning. and welcome. And thank you once again for the invitation. I think that we can all understand and admit to the fact that this coronavirus situation has really caused many of us to have to rethink how we do our jobs. And not only just because of the remote shelter in place, but also because professionally, how do you proctor, for example, a student's exam who requires a reader, scribe, and other kinds of technology, et cetera, when you are not allowed to leave your place of residence as well as the students not allowed to play, um, leave their place of residence. Um, Balan, next slide please. So what I'd like to do is talk to you just briefly about the fact that we serve many, many different kinds of students and really um, they're just about crosses the board. For example, we obviously have the new freshmen, the students who come with in their hands, their K-12 IEPs and Section 504, they have a level of entitlement and expectation because they have been accustomed to certain kinds of accommodations. Now they come to the university and they're expecting to have these accommodations be uh, completed and provided in the same manner and they are going to be in for a rude shock because the four years do not obviously operate the same way that the K-12s do for a number of variety of reasons, including the fact that there's distinctions in how we interpret the responsibilities. For example, in the K-12 situation, these students are, are given the guarantee that they have a right to success. Where at the post-secondary, <clears throat> post-secondary, we are required to make sure that we provide that equal access. Students who transfer in from California community colleges also have a great deal of expectations and entitlements. And so again, they have been accustomed to accommodations at their previous institutions, whether it be four year or CCs. Transfer students also have a root shock because they will also learn that the accommodations that they had had in the past may not transfer specifically and explicitly the same way they're accustomed. Then we have the temporary um, disabled individuals. And these are students who do stupid things, I will be honest. They will do things like jump into diving into a swimming pool that has no water. Um, they will do also some things that are sports related in which are, but regardless of what the situation is, we're talking about the fact that uh, we do also serve students who have a variety of disabilities, which may be either temporary or permanent. Now, when we look at pregnant students, we of course know that pregnancy in itself is not a disability, but we also are aware that students who are pregnant do have um, sometimes other conditions that may be an effect from their pregnancy. For example, they may get car um, you know, uh, the carpal tunnel and certain edema and other kinds of things. We also have to consider the fact that, interestingly enough, we don't serve students who are non-native English speakers, why? And if you think about it, the, the kinds of accommodations that a non-native English speaker would require are oftentimes very much the same kind of accommodations we would provide for someone else who may have a cognitive or auditory processing or other kind of disability. In other words, they would need extra time and they may actually maybe need a reader or something like that if they're not quite able to read even though they all would have had passed the TOEFL competency. But this is where you look at the situation and you say, what is it that we provide students with disabilities that would also benefit students that are not necessarily finding their way to our doors? For example, students who are not registered with us for many reasons. Wounded warriors, veterans, will not necessarily register with us because quite frankly, if you enlisted into the military, the word disabled is a negative. You don't want to be identified as having disability. You cannot identify as having disability. And now when they find that they do have a disability of some sort, they will probably tough it out. They have lost their hearing because they were near an IED explosion. They may have lost some motor or, or other kinds of capabilities. These students will be registered for classes. They will sit in the classroom and they will not be getting the full educational experience, nor will they necessarily be passing exams in a competent manner because the accommodations that they rightfully should be accessing 
They're not because they're not familiar with the ADA. They're not familiar with all the other laws that, in, that ensure that they have protections and, and guarantees for equal access. We also have students, of course, who come in with IEPs and they are going to defy their parents and want to just be on their own and independent and they just don't want to admit that they are different. And so these are the students who are registered and they're not gonna come out, quote unquote, until such time as they find <clears throat> that the situation regarding their accommodations have been um, are, are required, for example, after midterms. And the elderly, quite honestly, are any of us getting younger? I'm, I'm certainly not, unfortunately. So that means as I age, I'm finding my hearing is going, I'm finding that my vision is going, I'm wearing glasses as I talk to you um, because I can't see what's on the monitor without the glasses. And of course, my dexterity, what I used to be able to do physically, like open up those pill bottles and things like that, I can't do anymore now. I don't know who designed those packages, but they aren't fun. But anyway, as we recognize that there are all these populations that would benefit from many of the things we have discovered professionally that work for students with disabilities, and then we also understand and see what is out there for other people in general, this is where we can find that universal access is important. Next slide, please. Now, I just want to briefly talk to you about two models because the disability models, in particular, the medical model and the social universal design model. In the medical model, this is the model that traditionally services for students with disabilities and, and services in general for disabled individuals are conducted by. We, we put responsibility on the individual with a disability to identify, I have a disability, and we put responsibility on them to identify what they might require. And then we sit there and we pass judgment on whether or not we believe that they qualify for whatever accommodation is out there. And this is not appropriate because if by doing this, we have excluded a good number of people publicly who would benefit from accommodations. Again, the veterans, the wounded warriors, the, the students who are pregnant and may not know that they have a disability, people who are elderly, who by the way are a great source of revenue right now because they want to enroll in courses and they're auditing and they're doing all sorts of things and they're just doing for pure fun and pleasure. But if they're not seeing and hearing and being able to engage, then they're losing out and they may, that may cause us revenue. So rather than looking at what barriers exist and then just trying to reduce them, we need to go into the model where we say, if we know the barrier exists, let's eliminate them. Let's not even deal with it anymore with a duct tape. Let's talk about what can we do to make sure that the curb cuts and the ramps and the elevators are there because I can wager that the number of people that use an elevator, that there's a small fraction of people using elevators who actually require it and who would actually be able to pass inspection with HR or disability services as saying, I require the use of an elevator. Most people prefer it. Choice is wonderful. Choice is what universal design is about, the freedom, flexibility. Next slide, please. So now we look at how can we reframe not only disability services, but how could we reframe the whole educational process and how do we reframe the assessment process. When you think about the fact that international students, for example, are non-native English speakers, what we're doing when we say to students that they, can, they cannot get extra time and that they can't have other accommodations, we're saying that when you are being tested in a 50 minute spot, that you have to sit in your desk and you have to be not talking to anybody and you have to be not not looking at notes or anything like that to be able to demonstrate your ability to have a short-term memory and to be able to regurgitate lots of facts very quickly. But have you actually learned? And is this actually going to be pertainable to the real world work? Most likely not, because professionally, I think all of us know that when posed with a problem that we cannot resolve, we are not sitting there at our little desk and table and not accessing the telephone, the Zooms, the colleagues, and everyone else. That is the real world. And so we have created artificial barriers in the education system, which unfortunately have created extensive barriers and have maybe caused students to not be able to get the education that they deserve and seek. But what's interesting now is a coronavirus, although it's a nasty, horrible thing, there is a silver lining. So just as World War II provided a silver lining for education, because when wounded warriors came back in mass with the GI Bill, and they were seeking an education as part of their, um, um, as part of the deal for signing up. Um, well, actually not as for signing up, but they, they 
got as a part of their package the ability to use a GI Bill for educational purposes, suddenly the educational arena had to change to start accommodating the fact that education was not just for the white elite and rich. It was now going to include people of color. It was going to include the lower economic bracket. It was really a big eye-opener in the educational field. Now we're looking at COVID-19. What is that silver lining? It's also a horrible thing. It's a, it's a world war situation in many ways, in the fact that the whole world is affected. But what the silver lining is, is that we suddenly, suddenly had to go from in-person to online. We had to suddenly get creative. And creativity is really exciting in many ways. It can be scary for some. But for us, I would say that in our profession, it's created an ability to be more flexible, which has actually eliminated and reduced many of the barriers our students were experiencing due to the rigidness of how faculty perceive how they should teach and how they should assess. This is exciting for me professionally in the disability services area because I've been long time wanting to seek a way to reframe disability services from being strictly a medical model, um, we do this for you, we will pass judgment on you, to being flexible, to being educators, because there will always be faculty who are new to someone with a disability and don't know how to make something accessible. And there will always be students who are new to their disability because disability is not something you're just born with. Disability happens at all, at all times in life. It happens to all economic brackets. It happens to all, to all everybody. So we are all touched by somebody who has a disability. So instead of just saying we're touched by them, what do we do? How can we unify and work together to ensure a more accessible, universally accessible world? So as a colleague of mine loves to say, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that basically means if a boat is stuck in the sand and can't move, a tide coming in is going to not only lift it, but also lift other boats that may have also been similarly stuck, but you just didn't know about them. And now all the boats are able to float. So this coronavirus situation is a horrible thing, but it's also provided a great opportunity and a great time for us to really rethink, rebrand, and redo to create a more accessible world for all of our students who someday, who obviously even now may be in the workplace and need to be as independent as, and, as, and as highly functional as possible. Thank you. And now I want to introduce my colleague, Rasan, to talk about some of the things we actually had to learn pragmatically when we were suddenly shifted from online, from in-person to online. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting us here. My name is Rasan Ellison Johnson. I'm Associate Director of Services to Students with Disabilities at Sac State University. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we've learned um, in our transition to online learning. Um, first, as both practitioners and administrators in student services, Dr. Vance and I have long been proponents of universal design. So the juncture where the COVID-19 pandemic brought us seemed to be an opportunity to move forward in changing the paradigm of curriculum design at our own institution. What we learned is first and foremost, collaboration with our institutional partners is, is key. Um, you want to collaborate and identify your institutional partners that can collaborate best with you. At most colleges, it may be um, centers such as Centers for Teaching and Learning or Center for Teaching Excellence. In many cases, these resource centers have instructional designers who can help you design course curricula with multiple instructional modalities. Your instructional design professors, and even in this case with us, our instructional design professionals, were instrumental in assisting our faculty with constructing curriculum that um, focused on a few key components. One, um, built-in accessibility. So how do we make the how do we make the curriculum the curriculum accessible to all students, not just students who have disabilities, but to students broadly? So we think about it, first of all, how does the student access the curriculum? What is the intake process? Presenting learning material in multiple formats, um, which allows students with their varying learning types to access the curriculum in ways that are most effective for their learning types. This benefits all students, including students who have disabilities. Um, looking at things such as audio, recording the lectures. So providing recordings of the lectures in the online learning management system um, regardless of whether the course style is synchronous or asynchronous, which allows students to revisit lectures, make more meaning of the information provided at their own time and at their own pace. 
Students with certain types of disabilities, such as visual processing, low vision, and or blindness will have access to listening to the lectures at any time that they need to. Going back um, to review certain um, portions of the lectures and just students who prefer just to listen over um, actually reading and, and or taking notes um, will find this as a viable mode um, of study as well, and they will also benefit. And this is regardless of as to whether or not they have a disability. Providing detailed presentation slides um, that are available to all students. So students um, who are more visual learners, um, as well as students who may have auditory processing disabilities, um, will may find it beneficial to be able to, to read the the um, detailed lecture notes. And that is, of course, provided that the accessibility functions um, are built in. We know that most learning management systems have um, accessibility features that help you to build that accessibility into the content as you're creating the content for production to the students. So ensuring that um, we follow those particular um, guidelines and, and that we use that um, those resources that are already there in place for us um, is, is really important and is one of the things that we've been focusing on and one of the things that we've understood and 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 have experience where students have been um, gracious uh, that the university and that the professors have provided these particular um, resources. Um, in fact, the, sometimes the argument is that if you provide students with notes or if you provide them with too much detail that it will inhibit student learning but this is not true and in fact most students will add their own customization to the lecture notes that are provided by faculty in ways that help them make even more meaning of the information that's being provided um, they may incorporate other course materials such as videos textbook readings and other journal article readings into those particular customizations that they make into those particular um, presentation slides or detailed notes that perfect that our faculty um, provide. And then when we think about, you know, open source textbooks such as um, resources such as OpenStax um, provide different facets of accessibility. Um, of course, OpenStax provides textbooks that are digital and already made in digital format, which is beneficial to all students. Um, it makes the information more versatile and it also brings down the cost. So we're not only we're not only addressing um, accessibility of whether a person has different learning abilities. We're also addressing accessibility based on socioeconomic background and um, whether or not a person has the means to pay, you know, $300 for a book as, as opposed to getting a book free on the internet or getting it at more of a low cost option. And it's the very same quality, the same information. The, the biggest issue is that um, we, we don't have the publisher overhead. Um, and then thinking about creating um, course specific study tips. You know, um, in many cases, um, the faculty have um, a primary focus of particular learning objectives. And so designing study tips around those learning objectives of what the students should learn, um, providing a section of resources on how to prepare and how to study for um, that particular class, especially online, um, and making that a part of the course curriculum, making it a part of where, where you're dealing with for instance, the syllabus presentation, you know, if you have a 15 minutes or so video on that, where students have an opportunity to actually learn how to learn best in this class. And then you think about the auxiliary materials that are produced. So um, things such as videos, of course, making sure that they're captioned or, and they have audio descriptions, um, as well as articles um, that are accessible. So enhanced PDF and or Word documents that are, that are uploaded to the learning management system and providing other facets of learning outside of the lecture and assigned textbook readings is beneficial to all students. And it supports the students by providing multiple modes of information flow to the student, thereby allowing the student to take more of an active role in the learning process. Um, next slide, please. Some accessibility features are more nuanced to specific student populations, such as the deaf and hard of hearing. So when we think about how we make content available um, to the, the, those particular populations in our learning management systems, um, we look at things such as captioning and ASL, which is American Sign Language. Um, and what's necessary, we had to discover what's necessary um, to provide this to students in a meaningful manner. 
Um, what's necessary will depend on the platforms that are being used for asynchronous teleconferencing platforms. For instance, like WebEx, Zoom, or Collaborate, and understanding what interfaces are needed to provide um, effective and meaning, effective and meaningful um, ASL interpreting or captioning service experiences for students. We also had to look at what, when, when is there a need for um, actually using a, a live captioner versus the use of um, the captioning software that may be um, embedded in these particular um, um, platforms. For instance, um, you may have students that are in courses where there is specific terminology that is relative to those courses where um, embedded captioning systems may not provide the best experience for students. You may need a live captioner that will need to work with faculty to understand terminology and to add that terminology to their, um, their, 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 their devices so that they can provide the captioning more, um, a better context of the captioning and, and provide the captioning um, in a more meaningful way for those particular students as opposed to just utilizing um, the captioning features that are embedded um, into this, these particular learning platforms. And then when we think about um, alt media and, you know, for the, the ability to provide alt media is built into most learning management systems. Um, what is important as what was stated earlier is that we utilize those particular, um, those particular tools um, at the forefront of planning the curriculum so that when the students experience the curriculum, the students um, will actually be able to experience it in a robust manner. And so that includes alt, adding alt media to images, um, ensuring that any media that is uploaded to the learning management system um, is of utmost quality and it's usable for students. So quality and format of text uploaded to the LMS is, is really important. It's better to, for instance, upload direct digital versions of reading materials um, and to run those through the accessibility um, features than to uh, try to upload a, a copy that one is made because those copies will essentially just be a picture of what you've made as opposed to actually um, having OCR um, um, text that is that is manipulatable and, and students can actually um, ensure that they're getting the correct text in the correct context. Um, once again, like I said, video descriptions on videos um, and captioning of videos is very important. It ensures that students who are using um, the, the, learning, um, the learning components have every mode of accessibility to it. And it, like I said before, it's not just about the students who require it as an accommodation, but it's about all students because in many cases, there are students who don't need accommodations that actually appreciate the captioning. There are students who don't need accommodations that might even appreciate the video descriptions on the video. Um, next slide, please. The last thing I wanna talk about is um, thinking about how we assess learning outcomes. You know, for the most part, you know, assessment um, in large has been limited to, you know, quizzes and exams. But I think it's important to explore new ideas about how to assess course learning outcomes. Quizzes and exams are not the only ways to assess learning, student learning. Creating assessments that are meaningful and that ultimately allow students to have more of a real experience rather than hypothetical experience um, is really important. Um, for So in designing um, courses that are going to be online, looking at possible um, full semester projects that move in particular sequences that allow the student to, to actually complete and produce something tangible at the end can be a better assessment of learning um, than um, giving a quiz or an exam. However, on those particular um, or in those particular courses where, you know, quizzes and exams may be um, the most appropriate, then Many, many professors may be um, concerned with exam security uh, with students taking exams on uh, online. And so, you know, there's um, been a push to use different types of um, software or different types of programs that actually um, help with exam proctoring. And um, those particular programs, um, in some cases, can um, provide instances where students, especially students who have disabilities, um, may be flagged for cheating. Um, so in, in lieu of that, you know, we, 
considerations around designing um, maybe shorter exams where there is more of um, open ended questions um, as opposed to, you know, um, um, true or false or multiple choice where, where professors don't have to worry so much about exam security, but as more it, it will better um, assess the students um, learning in, in a way that demonstrates that they un actually understand the curriculum. They actually have understand the learning objectives. There's ways, there are ways to do that by designing shorter exams um, and that allow professors to actually, you know, read the students' responses as opposed to 50, 100 question exams that are timed and um, require um, and increase the likelihood that a student will be able to cheat. Um, like I said, um, I think that um, a lot of people, a, a lot of our colleagues have already expressed a, a lot of very good information this morning. And so at this point, I thank you for your time and I thank you for um, asking us to be a part of this great presentation. Thank you so much, Rosan. I think that was a really important sort of uh, perspective into people who are managing this transition right now. And so I think, you know, hearing about that there are steps you have to take, but that it's doable is, is really important. Um, on the next slide, it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Goldstein, who's going to talk to us a little bit about something that's one step back, the legal framework um, for accessibility that underlies a lot of these um, commitments to universal design, both the legal requirements, what schools and other institutions are required to do, but also the ways in which the law, including copyright law, permits them to do those things. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, so I am a recovering trial lawyer, um, uh, having aged out uh, from my practice, but for many years represented the National Federation of Blind and individual blind people. Uh, very much focused the last two decades on access to digital content, software, technology, uh, and um, that meant that one of the things I spent a lot of time doing was suing colleges and universities that did not voluntarily wish to comply with the law. Uh, and one thing that um, entering freshmen and indeed all disabled students are entitled to is uh, compliance with the ADA and 504. One of the things I, I found to my sorrow that is I think still true uh, is that we don't yet have an education, uh, uh, excuse me, an institution of higher education in this country, uh, I don't know about outside, uh, that complies fully with the ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, uh, but uh, perhaps someday that will happen. Um, even the best school you may find does not have, say, in the chem lab equipment that speaks. Uh, or there are system-wide uh, software that every institution uses, like financial aid software that is inaccessible and forces the student to go to another student and disclose her personal financial information. Uh, or when it comes time to look for a job, the alumni office's software for the uh, transcript ordering is uh, inaccessible. Um, that's in addition to what happens in the individual classes. So next slide, please. What does the law uh, require? Educational institutions are subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, the Rehabilitation Act, what's called Section 504 in shorthand. Each one of those uh, requires many things, but the most pertinent to us is to engage in equally effective communication. What does that mean? That means that whatever content you are communicating has to be as effectively communicated to the student, uh, regardless of disability. So you're, if you're up at the blackboard and you're saying you take this number here and you divide by that number there, beep, you've just failed. Um, <laughs> if the person can't see the numbers on the blackboard, uh, engaging in equally effective communication. Uh, if you have a graph that can't be represented tactily uh, or in some other fashion, 
uh, if you have a picture that doesn't have a descriptive label, uh, you ain't doing it. And if you uh, are providing the information later, we all know how semesters are. It's the student's privilege to pr procrastinate, but not the faculty member's privilege to procrastinate. So what does equally effective communication mean? Well, in 2009, we filed complaints with the Department of Ed and DOJ. Uh, there were seven colleges and universities who were doing a pilot program with the now long forgotten and little lamented Kindle DX. This was the large screen Kindle that would be useful for students. It was an inaccessible piece of hardware. And after those complaints were all resolved in favor of the students, uh, the Department of Justice and the Department of Ed sent out a dear colleague letter to in, on, in June of 2010 to educate colleges and universities. This is, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of this letter. And in that letter, it explained that uh, technology has to permit the student with a disability to receive all of the educational benefits provided by the technology in an equally effective and integrated, equally integrated manner. And a year later, not quite a year later, but May of 2011, they sent out some FAQs uh, to K-12 as well as to colleges and universities about what does this mean and explained that the technology needs to uh, deliver the same educational opportunities and benefits in a timely, equally effective, and equally integrated manner. To be clear about that, this means an equal opportunity to obtain the same result, not you're guaranteed to have the same result, the same opportunity, to, the opportunity to gain the same benefit and the opportunity to reach the same level of advancement. Now, how solid are these requirements? I would say pretty solid. There is a defense called fundamental alteration, but that is an alteration in the purpose of the software. Uh, so if the purpose of the software is to teach students, altering it to teach all students is not a fundamental alteration. There's also the question of undue burden. I think Harvard was hoping to argue that having to make caption all their videos would be an undue burden. But guess what? It's not the undue burden of complying with the, the law when you've been violating it. It's the undue burden of complying in the first place. So Harvard would have had to show that putting captions on a video today is unduly burdensome. Uh, it's not like I get excused because I've been a scofflaw for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. So IDEA applies to K-12. Um, and it's really a statute that I think is not terribly helpful uh, for us today. It guarantees a fair and appropriate public education. Um, what that phrase means may be a lot like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and it um, does not guarantee equal access. Um, K-12 is also subject to the ADA and 504 to the extent that IDEA is not. What does that lawyer gobbledygook mean? That means that if there is the school system is doing something that excludes people as a class because of their disability, you can attack that under the ADA and 504. Um, Somebody earlier mentioned the fact that you need to be aware not only of the student's disability, but the parent's disability. And um, I had a wonderful client who was a, a blind lawyer for the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, whose son was not doing his online math homework. And she couldn't help him because it was inaccessible. Uh, today, the Seattle public school system has undergone massive revision to make their software fully accessible as a result. Next slide, please. 
So Section 504, it's a very short and simple statute. It forbids discrimination in all programs and activities that receive federal funds. That's uh, pretty much uh, every post-secondary institution, except for I think there are one or two that don't take federal funds. Um, and then next slide, please. The ADA forbids discrimination by places of public accommodation and identifies places of education as a public accommodation. So uh, it's there's 90% overlap and the standard, the equally effective standard uh, is uh, the same uh, as are the defenses. So we can really in shorthand just refer to either one 504 or the ADA. Next slide, please. So this has been mentioned a couple of times, but it uh, bears repeating. Um, uh, Jonathan stole my line, but I love to say that building a 20-story building and then going an elevator, what a great idea. Just added 50% to the cost of, of, of putting in the elevator, if not more than 50%. Um, there is a strong business case for accessibility uh, YCAG, uh, uh, the, the World Wide Web Initiative, puts, puts one out that you can look at online. It's cheaper, it's more likely to work, less likely to break, and it's more likely to benefit non-disabled students as well as disabled students. The side benefits are always there. Kurzweil creates the first reading machine for the blind to do that. He had to invent something called a flatbed scanner, which almost all of us now have in our offices. Um, it, is, it is also the case that retrofitting, besides being a giant waste of time, can often be huge. Uh, the first design decision Google made with Android was to build it on an open source um, software called WebKit. In making that decision, they unconsciously made the decision to build Android as something inaccessible. It took them 10 years of working hard at retrofitting to make Android accessible. Next slide, please. This is the other part. Equally effective communication means timely communication. If you wait till the, stu till the student with a disability shows up, and by the way, they are as entitled to add and drop as everybody else, Semesters and quarters move quickly. And if you wait to make your open educational resource accessible till after the disabled student appears, you probably are not going to succeed with that student. Next slide, please. It is not a fun experience uh, for your school to get sued. Um, it is, I will tell you, very difficult for an 18 or 19 year old to make the big decision to file a complaint with the Department of Education or to contact the NFB or the Department of Justice. Um, everyone that I know has gone on to great success, but at a different institution ultimately, hanging in there in misery until the case was resolved and then leaving feeling like pariahs. It's tough on everybody. Um, it's not the way to affect change, broad scale change. Um, it is the way to get one student's education. Uh, and um, we have to do it. And sometimes uh, universities respond uh, well uh, and try to organize uh, uh, a plan going forward. Next slide, please. So the National Association of the Deaf versus Harvard is probably a case that all of you have heard about. Uh, and Harvard had a defense that frankly boiled down to, we're Harvard. Um, somehow that didn't quite fly. Uh, the consent decree requires Harvard to caption every video posted on a university website going forward, but also retrospectively uh, going back to the beginning of 2019. And 
for older videos, any member of the public who can't access the video because it's not captioned has the right to ask for it and get it on a five day uh, basis. Um, it would have been cheaper and better to have done that going forward. And think of all the non-deaf students who could have watched the video while they were on their treadmill. Next slide, please. So some good news to leave you with. Um, uh, the, um, back in 2014, um, with uh, some really good colleagues who made sure I understood the law, which was not easy, um, we tangled with the Authors Guild, uh, who didn't like the fact that the Hadi Trust was digitizing over 15 million volumes. I'm sure the number is up over 20 by now uh, from various colleges and universities. Uh, and uh, one of the things that digitizing those libraries did was groundbreaking from the point of view of people with disabilities. It made uh, that trove of our civilization available for the first time. And uh, so we wanted to vindicate and we succeeded in vindicating a very important principle. And that is making a printed copyright, copyrighted work accessible to a print disabled person is a fair use. And that principle, while it was established in the context of a printed copyright work, is not limited to printed to digital. It is fair use to make any copyrighted work that's not accessible to a disabled person accessible. So what does that mean? For those of you who haven't heard the fair use term before, fair use means it, you can use something that is copyrighted without the permission of and without paying the copyrighted owner. I see Meredith nodding, so I didn't screw that up too much. Um, and, um, uh, so as you, just as, as you use text in class normally, when you need to uh, make something accessible that's not, that's content, that's copyrighted, do it and God bless, you're not doing something that's wrong. I think that's, is, is there a next slide or am I done? I think I'm done. I think you, uh, I think you're done. There's always, we're always happy to hear more, but I think you have covered the assigned the assigned material, as it were. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. I think that's a really important backdrop that, you know, we talk a lot about the importance of universal design, but you don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is also a legal obligation. And the idea that you can just go forward and avoid it can lead to really um, unpleasant consequences as well. Um, I also think your, your point at the end about fair use and talking about how there is in fact this legal ability to match up with the legal obligation to create accessible materials is one to keep in mind. And um, very briefly, we're gonna hear from Prue Adler again about the way in which that same principle has been addressed and enshrined in international uh, treaty and talk a little bit about the process for the Marrakesh Treaty. Prue, thanks for joining us again. Sure, and I think that um, I was asked to give this very brief presentation because in the previous chapter of my life, I worked with many, many talented people um, on the Marrakesh Treaty and then the domestic legislation related to the treaty. Um, and so let me, let me walk through some of that um, for you. Um, the two recent national and international developments regarding accessibility you can see, the first is the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired or otherwise print disabled. And it offers an exception to country's domestic law for eligible people with disabilities. And I think you can see why we refer to this simply as Marrakesh, uh, given that long title. Uh, the treaty allows individuals and organizations to create and distribute accessible versions of books and other materials without first having to ask permission of publishers. Importantly, and this is, this is a really important, important aspect of the treaty, it permits cross-border sharing of these materials. 
such sharing will greatly alleviate the book famine. And the book famine is the situation in which the NFB um, estimates that no more than 5% of public works um, are created in an accessible format. And so think about how, just in the same way that Dan was just talking about opening up Haughty Trust, uh, think about if you are visually impaired in any capacity um, or disabled in a way that you can't hold a book, um, this opens literally the world of reading to you in terms of more accessible text available in more languages. Now, those countries that have ratified the treaty, such as the US and Canada, can send and receive works in accessible format from other countries that share a common language. Individuals in the United States who do not speak English as a first language or who are learning a new language will also benefit from the ability to import accessible format in foreign languages. Now, as Dan mentioned, um, Congress has long recognized the needs of those with disabilities through 504, the American Disabilities Act, and more. And uh, in 1996, the Copyright Act was amended to include exceptions for the creation of accessible material. This exception um, is Section 121 of the Copyright Act, and it gives authorized entities such as uh, research libraries, academic libraries, and institutions like the Library of Congress the power to create and distribute accessible copies of books and other materials nationally and internationally. So for example, the Queen's Public Library has materials in 59 languages to best serve their community, and the Brooklyn Public Library fields reference calls in 170 languages. And then of course, what we were just talking about, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of languages represented in the Hadi Trust, um, which Dan and I had talked about previously. With the ratification of Marrakesh, Congress again demonstrated its support for those with disabilities by expanding, updating, and clarifying 121. And in June 2013, Congress passed the Marrakesh Treaty Implementation Act. Importantly, the changes clarify who may benefit from excess materials. It's been expanded to now include not only those with print disabilities, but those who are blind, have a visual impairment, perceptual or reading disability, or physical disability. All of these laws, treaties, and policies demonstrate strong and continuing support by the US government and Congress to ensure equal access for those with disabilities. Together, these provide a flexible and evolving legal framework so that practitioners, teachers, librarians, and students can all fully benefit from access to learning materials in the most effective manner. So with that, I think I'll turn it back to Mary. Thank you so much, Prue. Um, on the next slide, I, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Sims, who's joining us from the University of Minnesota Library System. And having now talked about the legal framework that says you can take these materials and do what you need to do to make accessible copies, um, we wanted to hear a little bit from Nancy about the ways in which uh, librarians and the library system can help you with that. Nancy, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, a brief uh, caveat, because uh, I'm a, a lawyer as well as a librarian, I like caveats. Um, Libraries are not particularly ahead of the curve on accessibility. So I want to just right up front say, um, in many ways, we are learning. Um, we have some of the same um, failure modes that many other elements of universities do. Um, so we are people who can help with uh, OER production, um, but we're also people who are, um, I, I hope, working to improve our own services in, in a lot of uh, different ways. So could I just have the one slide. Could we go to that one, please? Um, and also individual libraries very widely. There are some libraries that have invested heavily in getting totally up to date on accessibility and others who just have not invested as much. Um, we can do a few things and I'm distinguishing here between accessibility and universal design in terms of accessibility is we can help you make things that already exist more accessible for students. Uh, we can help source materials for fair use conversion. So, um, you know, we can find things in our local collections and sometimes we can collaborate across institutions with digital collections. There are a lot of different experimental things going on related to collaborative 
access, uh, collaborative disability access to library materials. Um, we also do a lot of work with content vendors in the same way that many textbook um, people associated with textbook purchases on campuses do. So for a long time, accessibility has been a big part of negotiation with vendors. Um, we uh, we certainly require compliance with guide uh, with guidelines like WCAG guidelines and so forth. Um, the challenge there that is true across library content, textbook content, all kinds of things, which many other speakers have emphasized today, is that if you don't build accessibility in from the beginning, it's hard to build it in later. And when we're acquiring outside content, we're not part of the building process. So in the same way that we have to fight with commercial textbook vendors to get them, them to make their content accessible, libraries have to fight with library related content vendors to try to make the content accessible. And we tend to be under resourced for auditing, although that is something we are all trying to invest more into. Um, we also have people like me. So this is the ally part, which is uh, I'm, I'm an attorney and a librarian and my specialty is copyright law. Uh, I spend a lot of time translating legal concepts into things that people who are not lawyers can understand. So we can work with people across campuses and outside of them to help educate. And even though lots of my library colleagues are not themselves attorneys, many people in libraries have pretty good understandings of copyright and are good at explaining issues to other people. Um, one of the most important things that I think we have done in, at some institutions is help to help to have uh, people who serve students with disabilities, we partner with them to help uh, on outreach to general counsel with respect to things like the Hathi Trust work where we digitized libraries content and worked towards making it accessible under fair use. Um, and finally, switching to the other side, the universal design side. Some libraries are part of the production cycle for open educational resources. The University of Minnesota Libraries is one example. Um, and we work, it, Dual, dual avenues here, we work to comply with standards. Um, we also work to think beyond standards because standards don't meet everybody's needs. Um, and of course, we're not all perfect, as I said before. Um, I looked before this on our uh, textbook publication site. Most of our textbooks, especially the ones that are formulated in Pressbooks, can be downloaded in six to eight different file formats. Those accommodate different accessibility needs for people with disabilities and different accessibility needs for people who are using different types of technology to access the materials. So um, with that, I think we're running close on time. So I think I'll wrap up there. But if people have further questions, I'm happy to answer them in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Nancy. And um, yes, I know we are about at an hour and a half. We're going to probably run till about 145. But if anyone does need to drop off, this will be recorded and available um, online uh, in the middle of next week. On the next slide, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Alan Harnum from uh, the Inclusive Design Research Center. And they are one of the leaders in this sort of ecosystem of organizations pushing for a uh, more thorough consideration of accessibility and universal design in the open education space. And I think have a particular um, perspective on really having user-centered design, so not creating only sort of to serve people, but to create in a way that people can take agency and sort of serve and empower themselves. So Alan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm sorry you have to go last, but I think you really just get to go as the capstone to this experience. Um, Thanks again for joining yes, us. Yes, thank you. No, and no, uh, no worries. This has been such a fantastic um, slate of presenters. I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, so I'm Alan Harnum. I'm a senior inclusive developer at the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University in Toronto, um, Canada. I'll give the caveat um, inspired by uh, Nancy that I am also a librarian uh, as well as a software developer. Um, so just to talk briefly, and I just, um, I apologize for doing a presentation about user-centered design while off-center like this, but I have a laptop off to the side and a main monitor, so that's where you're sort of seeing the three-quarter perspective thing going on here. No problem. Um, so briefly, uh, if we can go to the next slide. So um, I would say um, 
in terms of talking, I, I like to talk about user-centered approaches um, in the design process. Um, and first of all, I, I would briefly um, sort of offer the, the kind of the formal definition of user-centered design um, is it's, it's a bit like one of those terms that for me is sort of like freedom, which is it kind of means to sometimes what the person talking about it wants it to mean in a longer definition. In the brief definition, it centers users. It's hard these days to argue that we shouldn't do that in our design as opposed to, you know, user hostile design. Um, the more recent term that I think Don Norman, who's one of the um, originators of the user-centered design language, has begun to use is human-centered design. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of the word user. Um, sometimes the joke is that there's only a few professions that refer to the people who, you know, take the things as users, and it's like software development, software developers, and drug dealers. So. There's been some, um, I, I, I don't, I think human centered design is a good term for thinking about um, some of the things that we're building, but we also sometimes have design that needs to incorporate the needs of non human actors like the environment or animals. So I'm still looking myself for a term that I kind of like better. Um, maybe inclusive design is, isn't, I'm sure our director would say it's enough to encompass that. Um, if you're looking to understand, um, there's actually, I discovered in, in sort of prepping for this, there's now an ISO standard that design, des the, defines what user-centered user design is, um, 9241.210.219. Um, so if you want the ISO standard definition, that is, it's apparently been standardized, but the idea is that people should be, um, their needs should be centered in the design process. Um, they should review throughout um, and this has been, this has been something that has, that has led to a lot of the specific things that you may do if you're doing development, um, of content or software, you'll do things like user experience research, um, things like, uh, you'll test your product iteratively throughout with your different user groups. You might make things like personas. Um, where we've been going at the Inclusive Design Research Center in the direction of some of our um, theoretical and applied work in the last couple of years has been towards um, a, mo a more co-design oriented approach, which is something that we, in the definitions of co-design that we've kind of developed and, and seen as part of the process of our work, it's a contrast of thinking about users as active participants in the full design process um, rather than simply research subjects or consultants. And that's meant to kind of provide a framing, I think of a particular sort of user-centered design that I think if you've been involved in any large or small software project in particular you may be familiar with where you do a whole bunch of work and then you're like, oh gosh, we got to do some user-centered design here because we said that we would and you scramble to pull you could buy a bunch of starbucks gift cards or tim hortons if you're in canada maybe like i am uh and you grab some users at the end and you're like please tell us what you think about this design and then you scramble and make a few fixes near the end of it and that's sort of the very kind of like gigantic nine foot tall straw man um criticism of some sort of supposedly user or human centered design approaches. So what, what we're interested in, I think, in advancing the sort of co-design idea is to um, think about how can we bring people on as fuller collaborators in, in whatever we're developing, whether it's a product or a process or some kind of analysis. So framing that in the, the educational um, or open educational resource context, um, we have been thinking about things like how students might adapt or remix or create open educational resources as part of their learning. There's been a lot of interesting innovations that I've heard of in people's teaching practices that have been enabled by that characteristic of OERs. I've heard of people who have um, teachers who have kind of like a rolling OER process where one class produces an open educational resource as part of its classwork, and then the next class is responsible for revising that, improving it, updating it, adapting it. So you get these kind of like interesting 
living documents of of the learning process that I think is enabled by OER in a way that is that's been hard to do in other contexts. Um, you, Travranis, the Inclusive Design Research Center's director, has made use of some of these approaches in her classes in the OCAD Master of Inclusive Design program. Um, she's even brought in students as sort of co-designers of the syllabus, the assignments, and the evaluation process. Um, and in terms of accessibility, one of the things that, that can be really advantageous in the OER development process is to involve um, students with disabilities as sort of ex what we call experts in their own needs from the beginning. And I think Jonathan uh, made a point really early on that I think is really important, which is don't take a single student with a disability and be like, you're now the representative for all disabled students. Nobody is capable of doing that. It's reductive and tokenizing. Um, but if you can get together groups of people with wide ranges of abilities, the individual expertise of people in their needs and preferences can be a really important resource to be tapped. Um, some of the inclusive design philosophy is that in aggregate working with diverse groups of co-designers, we can achieve much better results and help avoid missteps. And I'll, I'll be the, you know, the, the ninth, nth person in this to say, do whatever you can to avoid retrofitting. It's 10 to 25 times more expensive than doing it right from the start. Um, I have a running joke when I talk about, I, I wanna run a systems development conference someday called Please You Should Have Asked Us at the Start, which is where accessibility specialists uh, internationalization specialists and security specialists can all get together and just kind of commiserate about how they get brought in at the end of systems design when they should get brought in at the start. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. So um, the other point I would make uh, is that open educational resources are a huge opportunity for students to be creators as well as consumers and to sort of like really blur that boundary between we make the resources, you use the resources to kind of a more sort of um, creative approaches and, and collaborative approaches. But some of the considerations for that are, um, and this, this was really laid out, out by Cynthia early on in talking about um, the web content accessibility guidelines and the poor model for development of OER. So I, I won't sort of go over that. Again, I'm really glad she covered it so I don't have to. Um, but some of the tools to think, of, some of the things to think about is can students with disabilities create open educational resources as well as use them, which gets you into kind of your questions of tools of production, because there's been an unsurprising amount of emphasis on uh, being able to actually use, you know, to use the resource to be able to read the PDF. Um, to be able to participate uh, in some way in things like, um, Dan made a reference to chemistry labs, accessibility in lab facilities is still a largely unsolved uh, problem even for the best institutions. But there's a whole other side of that around, are the students capable, if you're working with open educational resources, are they able, even if you've kind of opened up the OERs as a means of um, collaboration and authorship, and student empowerment, are the tools that you're using for the production of those OERs actually suitable for various needs, uh, or can they be adapted to new tools? And this gets into the second point I would make, which is sort of thinking about affordances for authorship. What are the characteristics that an OER has that supports continued evolution and reuse? Is the open educational resource amenable to alteration to improvement. So I've got a sort of uh, a set, sort of three questions there that I thought of in terms of thinking about OER production and use, which is first of all, how easy is the produced form of the OER to adapt or remix? There's a huge difference between something that is uh, a web page with source code versus a PDF document that might not even have accessible tagging. Um, I really like what Nancy said earlier about the press books approach of producing like six to eight different formats um, from a single source document. Um, and I think that kind of, that ties in nicely to the second point I would make, which was are the intermediary forms of the OER available? Um, does it have source code? Are the documents versioned? Uh, 
can we trace patterns of transformation and adaptation? This is one of the things that gets really interesting when you're talking about accessibility, um, because we can think about how um, an original OER might, as it gets changed into different adaptations for accessibility purposes or other purposes, we don't yet really have an established way of kind of tracing this resource originates with this resource like there's ways to model these relationships but even in many open educational resource systems they're not especially well implemented but that's a really interesting thing to think about in terms of of systems um and intermediary forms like source code mean that it's much easier to take something and adapt it to another context um the third question is how would someone offer an improvement or a fix to an existing oer that's kind of the wikipedia user editing scenarios do your I'm systems like enable that sorry i think was was that feedback for me or oh, okay i'm just going to go on um how how could people offer improvements there um and i know i'm just at about time so i'm going to hop to the next slide so this is just sort of some of the things that the IDRC has worked on that might be of interest. Um, the Flow Project is our umbrella project for a lot of our open educational work. Um, Sizzle, which is a collaboration with CAST and SRI to build inclusive environments for K-12 content, including open educational resources. Uh, the Inclusive Learning Design Handbook and the Inclusive Design Guide um, which is kind of our gathering of our collective learnings on open educational topics and inclusive design. We worked on the Access for All metadata standard, which is an accessibility metadata standard so that we can actually categorize what educational resources, uh, what are their accessibility features, what um, that's been implemented in a few places. The last one is work that we did on co-designing inclusive cities, which seems a bit of an odd addition to this list, but that actually contains really extensive documentation and resources of our co-design process that can be adapted to other contexts. Um, and I think that's 10 minutes exactly, which was what I was slotted for, so. Thank you uh, so much. Thanks so much. Um, and I want to really emphasize that uh, these slides will be available and that this webinar is really intended just to be an encouragement that these tools and resources are out there. You know, we couldn't possibly cover all of this content, even if we were doing this for an hour and a half for the next two weeks. And so, you know, our hope is to provide sort of a perspective on what is broadly available for further work. Um, on if, Bill, and if we could go to the last slide, please. Um, so I want to introduce very briefly to talk about a little bit of that uh, future work, my colleague Peter Yazzie at American University Washington College of Law. Um, you know, throughout this, we've, I think, seen about how the ownership and agency of content that can come out of a combination of open educational resources and then also an understanding and a reliance on fair use is really very important. And within that context, that there is a model for communities of practice to sort of explore and document how fair use works in their professional practice. Peter, could you just give us, we have, do have only a few minutes left, but just a minute about the best practices work and what's coming up for OER. Uh, sorry, I think you're muted. Thank you, Meredith. This has been an extraordinarily, um, rich afternoon and I've learned so much from listening and you're right we think and we are going to continue to proceed on the assumption that the fair use doctrine and copyright law which Dan mentioned earlier in connection with the hockey trust decision has enormous power and utility for makers of OER not only to help them meet their accessibility obligations, but also to help them make their OER better, more robust, more flexible, more attractive. And over the next several months, we're gonna be working on a document, a so-called best practices and fair use document for OER, which we hope, because 
whether we're successful or not depends very much on how much cop, uh, uptake and cooperation we get from the, the OER community itself. We hope that the result of this document will be a useful guide for practitioners in the OER field to, to think about and to make the most of this important uh, positive exception to copyright law. Thank you. So stay tuned for that. We've done it a lot with other communities in the last 15 years. It's been quite successful. We're hoping it will be here as well. In the meantime, we've got some other webinars coming up, including one that's of special importance and I hope interest, and that is talking about how the kinds of educational exceptions to copyright law that can enable the making of the best and most flexible OER relate across the US-Canadian border, because we know there's a lot of cooperation in OER production and adoption across the border, and we're hoping to be able to demonstrate next week that although the names of the copy relevant copyright doctrines in the two countries are different, they have a tremendous amount in common, enough so that OER that's compliant with one should cross the border successfully without let or hindrance. And then beyond that, we have some other fascinating webinars um, in the in the pipeline. You want to mention those? Sure. Uh, um, so we're working on an ongoing series to meet uh, sort of questions and needs that are coming up in this transition to online teaching. As Peter says, we have a webinar on copyright in the US and Canada. After that, we have a webinar on working towards anti-racism and culturally responsive teaching in open education. And we have um, just begun planning another after that about um, understanding how to interpret and apply fair use for questions around using music in teaching and learning. So um, this webinar will be available at the URL in the slide, auw.cl slash OER, as will the slides and uh, the transcript of the Q&A. Thank you all so much for joining us. And yeah. hopefully we will see you again for the next three or four Fridays. Thanks thank for all of your hard work and we will hopefully see you again soon. And thank you to the participants.